My brother and I grew up surrounded by science. The belief that an idea can change the world. My story is no different from millions of others. Middle-class family, my father is a teacher, and my mother a housewife. Big dreams, limited material resources, and lots of hard work. What differentiates us is that we got lucky. Really, really lucky that we found the idea that we are truly passionate about. The idea of moving from the original human genome project to the global genome project. To solve the fundamental biases in the ways scientists have collected data about the human genome, which severely limits the genomics promise, the promise of precision medicine for everyone. When we were growing up, my brother and I looked forward to our annual summer holiday, a 1,000-kilometer train journey from India's capital, New Delhi, to Bar, a rural town in the state of Bihar. The train transported us from a bustling metropolis to a carefree country paradise where we slept under the stars. Every night, our grandparents told us wonderful stories about the victory of good over evil and about the impact of one person's actions on the lives of many around them. In each of these stories, the protagonists did not know if they would win or lose. They were focused on doing their deeds to the best of their ability. Winning or losing did not matter. What mattered was doing your best. And these stories have shaped the core of who we are today and our commitment to making a difference. Now let's fast forward a couple of decades to the year 2000. The world is celebrating the writing of the Book of Life with the release of the first draft sequence of the human genome. For biomedical scientists, this marked the start of the biomedical genetic revolution. We would finally understand the root causes of conditions ranging from diabetes and heart disease to cancers and rare genetic syndromes. Not only would we be able to use this knowledge to develop treatments to cure the disease, but we could also use this information to prevent diseases, predict the risk, and ward off ailments ahead of time. You could avoid the physical, social, financial, and emotional cost of the disease. And it led to the concept of precision medicine, the right drug to the right patient in the right dosage at the right time based on genetic analysis. The promise that irrespective of who we are, our race, our social strata, our wealth, each one of us can have a health intervention that is tailored specifically for us. Not only will we live longer, but we will lead a healthier and more productive life. Just imagine. But 18 years on, or almost a generation later, while we have made substantial progress, this vision has been slow to arrive. We still don't know as much as we would like on how to use genetics to predict and prevent a disease. Regular drugs don't often work. Even targeted therapies aren't effective for everyone, and they can be phenomenally expensive. To put it bluntly, healthcare is broken. 90% of the drugs that enter clinical trial will fail. We spend $1 trillion on medicine globally every year, but 40% or more are ineffective. Another $400 billion wasted. What a colossal waste of time, energy, money, and lives. It's clear there's a problem, but what is it? I believe the problem is with our, with our existing understanding of the human genome itself. 
The first human genome was a combination of sequences of a handful of volunteers. As sequencing has got faster and cheaper, we have more data from more people, but it's drawn from a relatively small genetic pool. In, in fact, in 2016, 81% of the genetic sequences in the databases were from white European populations. 60% of the world constituted less than 5% of genomic data. India, which is about 20% of the world's population, comprised less than 1% of genomic data. So we are missing a lot. And that means that researchers who are trying to understand disease and develop treatments are doing so based on incomplete information. But you may ask, why does it matter? The genetics defines, first, our response to the treatment. Second, whether we will suffer any side effects. Third, on how drugs are broken down and cleared from the body. But each one of us have three million subtle variations that are linked to our underlying genetic heritage and have not necessarily anything to do with the disease. So if your treatment is targeting these variations which are linked to your heritage and not the disease, that treatment will simply not work. For instance, a research published in Nature in 2016 found that of the 192 genetic variations which were linked to a disease, only nine of them were actually truly disease-causing in South Asians and Latin Americans. The rest were just harmless variations linked to the underlying genetic heritage. From our own study, uh, in our cohort of Indian patients, uh, when we were using publicly known genomic data, we found that a particular genetic variation, which is supposed to cause seizures, was present in 96% of these patients. And these were he healthy adults who had never experienced seizures. Now just imagine the consequences of the wrong diagnosis based on the wrong data. And it matters for all of us, wherever we are in the world. So six years ago, my brother Soumya is now a clinician scientist at Harvard. And one day in July, I go to meet him and his colleague, Dr. Jonathan Picker, uh, for a coffee. What was supposed to be an hour-long meeting extended to most of the day, much of it pacing down the corridor, sharing our excitement about the promise of genomics and our frustration at the pace at which progress was being made. It became obvious to us that unless we fix the bias in the underlying genetic databases, we will never realize the promise of genomics and deliver precision medicine for everyone. As we had diverse populations, we can start distinguishing the signal for the disease from the signals linked to the populations. But to do so, we needed more human genomes. It's the same transformation that voice recognition technology has gone through in recent years. When I first tried Siri, I had to mimic an accent that she would understand. Now our virtual assistants, now our virtual assistants can understand whatever we are saying, even in noisy environments like a restaurant. This happened because the underlying machine learning algorithms were fed with data from diverse populations with different accents. And this is the same transformation that we are creating and contributing to in drug development, diagnosis, and discovery. Amplifying the true signal linked to the disease and reducing the noise linked to the underlying population by adding more diverse data. For this, we started our initiative to democratize genomics in India, the country of my birth, because I'm passionate about contributing to her progress. She's a land of over one billion people with over 5,000 subpopulations to compare and contrast. A strong scientific tradition and love for technology and a huge diaspora across the world. Yet, she contributes less than 1% of genomic data. Ultimately, 
we will gather genomic and metabolomic data from one million people from underexplored populations by 2022. Understanding how genetics impacts health and then turning them into actions to positively disrupt healthcare. And this matters not only for people in these regions, it can be turned around to everyone's benefit. A bit like an encryption key, like a Rosetta Stone, that unlocks the secrets of the genome for billions. Genomics will empower us. Imagine having a mobile app for pharmacogenomics right in your pocket, which tells you which drugs are suitable for you, analyzing genomes in real time. This will give you the power to take control of your treatment with your health provider. This is not a future dream. We are piloting it right now with Singapore's Precision Medicine Initiative. Now, some might say, this is a ridiculous idea. Genomics and precision medicine technology is far too expensive to be, to be brought into countries like India and other markets in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, when even Western healthcare providers are struggling to deliver the benefits of genomics medicine. So I want to end by telling you why I believe this can happen and why many of the innovations will be re-exported back to Europe and North America. And that brings me right back to the start of my story. The railways transformed India like they have transformed every subcontinent and every continent. Not only did the railways mean that I could go and visit my grandparents and hear their wonderful stories, it empowered every Indian to travel anywhere in an affordable way. It democratized transport. Yet, public railways were once thought to be a ridiculous idea that was simply too slow and expensive. In 1823, a UK member of parliament declared a railway can never enter into a successful competition with a canal. But the British public had other ideas. When the Liverpool and Manchester line opened in 1830, it transported 445,000 passengers in the first year alone. Now, while that took a few decades, an even faster pace of change had happened with the mobile phone. Back in 1990s, the Indian government had an ambition to move from two phone lines for every 100 people to five phone lines for every 100 people under the five-year plan. That would have taken decades to get decent phone coverage across the country. And then the mobile phone revolution happened. Right now, India has almost 90% phone coverage, 500 million internet users. 80% of the internet usage happens on mobile phones. This technology has transformed lives, changed consumer behavior, and introduced a fundamental and disruptive shift, all in the course of just over a decade. I still feel like that little boy on the train today. But instead of traveling from New Delhi to Bihar, I'm dreaming about the places that this genomic journey will take us to. And like my grandparents taught me, I shall do my very best to realize this dream. I believe that genomic technology can democratize healthcare for everyone, not just in the rich countries, but in some of the poorest parts of the world. It needs a big vision and big investment and the kind of global collaborations that we are creating with like-minded universities, companies, governments, and foundations. I also believe that the numbers will add up. Niche markets become big when you have enough people. A global market for healthcare will drive down cost and bring modern precision healthcare and make it accessible to people around the world. To make this happen, 
we need to gather data that represents the true richness and diversity of humanity so that we and the generations to come can benefit from the realization of promise of genomics. It is time to move from the old human genome project to a new global genome project, and that includes all of us, wherever we are. Thank you. Thank you.